All right then, if you have your Bibles, we'll ask you to turn to Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29. And we're just going to read part of verse 18 for our thought tonight. Proverbs 29 and verse 18. Proverbs 29 and verse 18, the Bible says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. Now, I have preached on this many times before. I don't know necessarily here. I may have. I may not have. But uh, I preached it usually from a, type, from a thought of a missionary standpoint. If we don't see what's out there, and if we don't see the need of the gospel, what will happen to your church individually is that it will perish. It will die because you have nothing beyond the here and the now, and you go down. And that definitely is applicable here, but also, if you read the context and uh, uh, see what the message is, it's literally talking about these two things in the forefront of your face, and that is your eyes. And uh, where there is no vision, people perish. Now, you think about if you could not see, what would you do for yourself? There are very few jobs for the blind, right? Uh, how are you going to make a living? And if it's a hundred years ago, how are you going to hold your garden out? And how are you going to feed your stock? What are you going to do if you're blind? What are you going to do if you cannot see? And really, there's, there is no, no uh, remedy for that when you cannot see. Now, if you want to feel vulnerable tonight, close your eyes. We'll do it for about 15 seconds. And how do you feel? And I feel a little, a little vulnerable, but not that bad. And you know why? Because everyone in this room is my friends. But what if you were out in public? I remember the most memorable, memorable point in my life as far as nursing goes, and it was years before I went to nursing school, I was taking a little CNA program over at Erin, and Miss Buttermore, she was a wonderful teacher, she was born to be a teacher. And uh, what she did, she blindfolded us and had someone else feed you because she wanted you to know how dependent these people are on you. Now, what are they putting in your mouth? What does it taste like? What's it gonna be? Is it bitter or sweet or salty? Well, what is it gonna be? Uh, and even with that, having someone to aid you, if you cannot see, there's not much you can do. They're, they're, you're, you're dependent on someone else whether you like it or not. Now, I've known people who very, do very well in small places and are completely blind. I took care of them in their homes, and I've seen them in the nursing homes. We have what's called the clock method, and we'll say your apples are at, are at 6 o'clock, your meat is at 12 o'clock, and your potatoes is at 3 o'clock, and they'll know on their position of the plate where their food is at. And, and, you know, and that's a help, and that's not seeing. One time it surprised me very much. I had, uh, I had gone to see a blind patient, and when I got to the door, she said, Come on in, Larry. And I said, How did you know it was me? And she said, I knew your truck. She said, I know what your truck sounds like. Mm -hmm. And so there's a little bit of compensating in that as well. But what... What do we feel when we're blind? Now you think about the lost tonight and all the lost people that you know, and dear friend, they're blind. They're very blind. They cannot see 
the spirit world. They cannot understand what you understand. They don't know there's an everlasting soul. They don't understand and know that there's a God who's King of kings and Lord of lords and that he is on high. And you know why? Because they can't see it. And we find ourselves in that situation today. Now we know of many instances in the Bible, and we're going to look at one of them, where blind people came to Jesus to be healed. Now, what do you suppose they did that? What, what was the reasoning behind coming to see Christ? Well, it wasn't a spiritual thing. Everybody think they, well, he, they're looking for a Savior. No, what they were concerned about is their eyes. Because, see, in that day, there was no food stamps, and there was no SSI, and there was no Social Security check, and there was no disability check, and what you had was what you could beg out of another man. And you know what? Lost people, that's you. That's who you are, whether you realize it or not. And so we, we, we are born in a blind state spiritually always. Now go with me to the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, Matthew chapter 15. And we find a group that you would not ordinarily think was blind. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 10. Matthew 15 and verse 10, the Bible says, And he, meaning Christ, called unto the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Now, it's one thing to hear, and it's quite another thing to understand. Now, we were talking about a dear friend of ours we lost uh, several years ago after she had had a baby. And I, I told my mother-in-law and my brother-in-law that what really killed her is that she had a clot in her mesenteric artery and her bowels died, all of it. Now, you know, the, the thing of that is, it don't mean much to a whole lot of people, does it? And you know why? Because 99.9% .9 of the population don't even know what a mesenteric artery is, right? That is the lost person. So just because you hear it certainly doesn't mean you understand it. And that is the gospel of most people today. That is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when you think about the King of kings and the lords of lords, high and lifted up on his throne, and yes, he has to come to you, that's offensive to the flesh. And you know what? We don't want to see that. Lost people do not want to see that they're dependent on God. Now, in the reality is this, they're dependent on him for their next breath. But they do not, what? See it. They cannot see it. And so we see that uh, the Lord Jesus makes this proclamation and says, listen, I want you to hear and understand. Verse 11, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth the man. And when his and then came his disciples and said unto them, Knowest thou uh, that thy, that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? Now I want you to see in, in in the in the twelfth verse there, they are rebuking Christ for the content of his message. Can you imagine such an approach? Of, well. And that's the reality today, whether we realize it or not. Whatever doctrine the Bible teaches, and if we don't like it, you're throwing that in the face of God. You, you offended the Pharisees. Well, so what? They needed to hear it, right? You know what one of the most offensive doctrines is? And I don't understand this, but the older I get, the more I see preachers giving it up, and the more that I, I, I don't understand is two things. Number one, the local church is the assembly of God. And number two is people don't want to hear about separation and specifically dress. You want to make a group mad before you get the meeting going good? Just lay that out there for them. 
But I want you to see that Christ wasn't upset about it, was he? You know why? Because they needed to hear it. They needed to understand it. They needed to know it. And, and, and so we see, we find his disciples rebuking him instead of the other way around. Verse 13. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father have not planted shall be rooted alone. I mean, excuse me, rooted up. Let them alone. And if, if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall, in, fall into the ditch. Now, we find another thing about blindness here, and we kind of touched on it in the introduction, is you are dependent whether you like it or not. Now, uh, I really don't know what the man did around the town, but back in the 70s, I'm sure my mother and father-in-law will remember this, there was a blind man always walking around the square. And he didn't care who you were or what you did. When he got ready to cross the street, he'd get behind someone and do like this on their shoulder. And you would lead him across the street when it was safe. Mm -hmm. and, and you watched out for him. And I, I just remember a lot of days he had a long black coat and uh, 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 everybody lead him about town. And he had some kind of job because he was always in town. But can you imagine that poor man grabbing the shoulder of another blind man. That's what false doctrine is about, is it not? Mm -hmm. grabbing, the sh grabbing the shoulder of the blind. And here we find the, the very same thing, but I want you to, what does Christ say? Let them alone. You know what? Present the gospel to them and be done with it. We don't have to berate them. We don't have to tell them in 96 points where they're wrong. Just teach them and leave it there. And you know what? If they remain blind, that's God's will. And, and so we find then that there are a lot of blind religious people in 2024. And they're doing exuberant things. And it looks like they have mass numbers. But what are they really they're really blind. They're, they're, they're really not seeing the eternal picture. Gospel of Mark, chapter 8. Mark, chapter 8. And we're going to begin reading in verse 22. We see the healing of a blind man. Mark 8, verse 22. And he come to Bethesda. Now, if you remember, this is the exact same place where the pool of Bethesda is located. And you remember uh, the, the man, the crippled man that wanted to go into the pool of Bethesda. And he said, but before I get it done, somebody jumps in front of me. And then the water quits moving and it's all over again. Very same city, very different circumstances. Now, I want you to see in that two things. First of all, there's always a desire for fleshly healing. There is not always a doubt. I'll say, the, I'll even go this far, there's never a desire for spiritual healing. But because by the time you uh, have that desire, by the time you have that eternal desire, he's done working on you. Because you know what? That doesn't, come, that doesn't come from this flesh. That comes from God. And so we see, we see then that the Lord Jesus is going back to the very same city at the in the very uh, the very same place that uh, he would do the other miracle in later. And he cometh to Bethesda, and they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. Now, I want you to notice there's something interesting about this text. It doesn't say who. Now, did his friends bring him with a genuine compassion that their that their dear friend might be able to be seen be able to see again? Did the Pharisees, to once again question the authority of Christ, did they bring him to deny the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ? I don't know, but I will say this: there was a reason that he took him aside. I don't know that I fully understand the reason, but there's a reason that uh, 
that this occurred. There was a reason that, the, that Christ did it just this way. And he took the blind man by the hand. Now, remember this, blind people. The only way you can move is by the hand of Christ. That's the only way you can get around. That's the only way that you can uh, avoid problems is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. Now, I want you to see here, Christ did not want any uh, spectacle. He didn't want any big applause for what he had done. He didn't want to make a show out of it. So he took him away privately. Now, again, as we said when our eyes were closed, that man had to feel vulnerable. Think about the old man I told you about that used to walk around Dover. He was dependent on someone he couldn't even see. And in the very same way, this, this blind man that, that is desiring healing has to hold hands of a person he doesn't even know. To me, that would be quite scary. I don't hold hands with anybody but my children and my wife. Right? But a perfect stranger who you've never seen. That's faith. That, 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 that is following the Lord Jesus Christ in, in what you know to do. And so we see this guy, this, this man does it. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. And when he had spit on his eyes. Now, uh, get the picture here. And, and a lot of people will group these events together. I personally am one of those people that I believe this man was different than the one that he made the putty with. I do not believe it's the, the same instance, is what I'm saying. Because he, uh, uh, it doesn't say he spit and made, uh, and, and made blood, with, I mean made mud with the spittle. It said that he spit in his eyes. Do you ever think about that? Now, uh, that's pretty tough to take, isn't it? I don't think I've ever been spit on. But I wouldn't be a happy camper if it happened to me. You know what I'm saying? Spit's nasty. The dirtiest part of your body is right here. Do you know that? Proven fact. If you want to swab and see some really gross bacteria, swab your mouth. And then Christ spits on him? What do you, how vulnerable did that blind, that blind man feel? How, 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 how distrustful did he feel when the Lord Jesus Christ spit on him? Did he feel betrayed? I, I don't know, but it, it was a very, a, a very vulnerable time for the blind man. And lost people, it's a very vulnerable time for you. Trust in Christ. And that is the final summation you have to come to this blind man since he's being spit on and, and being led around by a person that he didn't know, he trusted Christ. And, and that's imperative to the life of the believer is that we trust Christ. And he took the blind man out of the hand, uh, out of, by the hand and led him out of town. And when he had spit on his eyes, he put his hands upon him and asked him if he saw aught or anything. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. Now, again, from the flesh, we'd have to say, well, that's a, that's a halfway job, right? When I do like this, I, my vision is not good at all. I, I thank God for my glasses. Uh, I see people, but I don't know who you are. I know who you are because I know where you sit. <laughs> but as far as recognizing my friends and my family, I couldn't do it. Uh, and we find then that's the same situation this man is in. And remember Paul? He never saw again after meeting Christ. Well, let me put it this way. He never saw well again. He got his vision back after three days. But remember when he wrote to Timothy, he said, you see how big a letter I write? Uh -huh. And why did he write in big letters? 
because he couldn't see well. And very same thing here. Man would look at that as incomplete, wouldn't he? That he didn't quite get the job done. He was blind, and all he saw was black, but now all he sees is blurred. Let me remind you of this. Christ never does anything that's not the perfect will of the Father. Ever. And, and, and so, whatever this was, now I, I believe in this specific in, instance, it was to bring more glory unto himself and to show that he was the healer because what, what happens next? Notice, he says, I, 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 I can just see big things out there. And after he put his hand again on his eyes. Now, what is missing this time? Spit. The spit. Mm -hmm. See, Christ can heal like this, can he not? Spit is carnal, is it not? I can spit. Mm -hmm. But touching someone and restoring sight, that's out of my scope. It's out of my ability, right? And it's out of everybody's ability. And, and so we find that he does just that. And the Bible says he saw clearly. He was able to get the full picture. He was, being a, he was able to see with clarity. And what comes with vision is understanding and knowing and understanding what's going on. And he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. Now, if you underline in your Bible, I want you to underline that word restored. Now, two things on it. Number one, he may have seen, he may have been able to see at some point in his life, because see, something's not restored if it doesn't already exist, right? When you restore a house, the house is already there, right? You're just working on it. And, and so maybe, maybe he did have vision in times past. And then the other possibility is this. See, I was saved from eternity past. And then God saved me in the living. He, he restored. And, and that restoring is uh, like bringing back the inheritance. Remember uh, when the prophet was bidding on his wife, she had run away as the harlot. And he bought her back. That, that's the restored part. And so we see then Christ can deal with blindness. Christ is the remedy for blindness. He has an understanding of making people whole again and making them see their spiritual situation. Last place, the Gospel of Matthew. Very familiar verses of Scripture, but I want you uh, to focus on it one more time with me. Matthew chapter 14 and beginning in verse 23. Matthew 14 and verse 23. The Bible says, And when he had sent the multitudes away, uh, the main congregation gone, he went up into a mountain apart to pray, and when evening was come, was there alone. Now remember, he had already dismissed his apostles. Now, everything, everyone thinks that being close to Christ is peaceful. Not always. You know what comes with being close with Christ? Risk. Risk. Trouble. Difficulty. Everybody, oh, if I get a little closer to Jesus, well, I certainly hope you do, but uh, don't expect a, a roses without thorns because it's not going to happen. And so these individuals were put literally in the middle of the storm and they were the closest living people to Christ for that day and he deliberately puts them in the line of the storm. But the ship was, verse 24, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed from waves, the wind was contrary. And, he, and in the fourth watch of the night, that's the very end of the night, just before daylight, and in the fourth watch, Jesus came unto them walking on the sea. And when his disciples uh, saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit or a ghost. And they cried out with fear. 
Now, what did they see? Now, their vision has become a problem again, right? Their vision is the point that they can't recognize Christ. You ever had instances in your life where you didn't recognize Christ in it? When the bank account empty is empty and there's this many bills to pay, you say, oh, God can't be in this. Yeah, He can. He most certainly can. And sometimes He's glorified the most when He is. So yes, He's in those circumstances. He's in those situations. Whether we want to acknowledge it or not, He is there. And, and so Christ just feed from them and they say it's a ghost. It's a spirit. It, it, it's something that's going to harm us. It's something that's going to scare us. It's something that's going to add to this already horrible situation. But they didn't see well. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, and as I be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. Now, don't get down on Peter, because we all do it. What is, his, what is he really saying here? He was questioning the person of Christ. If it be thou, if you're really Jesus, then call me to you. That's a pretty scary thing. Now, uh, I don't think, I think the biggest challenge in that day would be living with the living Christ, seeing him every day, and yet knowing he's God. You know, that, that had to be very difficult at times. He got hungry. He got tired. And, and yet without sin. But they saw him like none of us ever will. Because when we get to glory, we're going to see him in his deity. Not as he was as a man. And so these individuals question and says, if it be you, if it really is you, they should have recognized him, but they didn't. And most time in our life, we should recognize him, but we don't. Verse 29, and he meaning Christ said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on water to go to Jesus. Now, I'm not one of these people, uh, you know, when we, when we get to glory, I, don't, I, I think it'll be a praise fest. People just giving glory that's due the Father and the Son that's well due, due them. But I've heard old time preachers say, well, there's a few things I want to know. Well, I don't know if you'll ever know them or not. <laughs> but there is one thing. There's a few things I'd want to know, too. <laughs> how many steps did he take? How, how far did he go? Did he come down on the ship and begin to walk to Jesus? We don't know how many steps he took. How many do you think you would take? I don't know if I'd get out of the boat completely, right? But he began to walk to Jesus. So I take that as he, as he must have made some steps right. He must have walked safely for a bit of a distance. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink and cried, saying, Lord, save me. Now, I want you to see he took his eyes off Christ. When you head out there tomorrow to another day at work, to another day, uh, Brother Junior's got some minor surgery. When you get all that together and get it going in tomorrow, what are you going to see? The average day when you get up, what do you see? It's very hard to get up and say, I see another opportunity for Christ to use me today. A lot of times when I get up, I'm like, okay, I've got to do eight. Somehow I've got to do eight more today, <laughs> right? It all depends on kind of what you see, don't it? Do you see an opportunity or do you see trials? Do you see opportunity or do you see difficulty? Because, see, we need, if ever was a need for the Lord's churches to keep their eye on Christ, it is today. 
And you know another place you can keep your eye to? Israel. Mm -hmm. Hey, things are things are getting getting good over there. Depending on how you want to look at it. Our dear president is saying, now Israel, y'all don't do nothing. That's a very poor advice. Israel's got into bad trouble lots of times <laughs> when someone cried, peace, peace, right? Mm -hmm. You know what would be wonderful and joyous and make me look toward the eastern sky? If they attacked them and the mosque was blew up on the Temple Mount. I would to God that it would be because see, that means things are getting very, very close. Because see, a temple can't be built there if the mosque is gone. And when the mosque is gone, hey, it's clear sailing. So we see then, how are you looking at the days that we're living in? Is it a source of discouragement? Is it, is it another monotonous day to live? Or is there glory in that? Is there happiness in that? Is there excitement? That, hey, this could be the day. This could be the day. Your vision is essential.